for those who were here the other day, we talked about how your plasma makes it through death, that you actually see a sequence of symmetries, which are the fold operations in your DNA, the clue form constant. So we're going to talk about this afternoon about how DNA gets your plasma ready to navigate the afterlife. How appropriate. Thank you. But before we do that, we promised we'd continue the open dialogue. Since we covered quite a lot this morning, and maybe you've been meditating on a few things over lunch, and there's something on your mind, or also feel free to introduce yourself really briefly when you have a comment or ask a question. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Richard Cullen from South Africa. Came all the way from Africa. <laughs> And um, I have one important question concerning my late brother who was murdered on his dairy farm two years ago. And um, I'd like to know what's happened to his soul. Well, the plasma that leaves the body after death um, is, is measurable. We know that much. Um, and usually that plasma looks for a place that's compressible. Um, this, the shape of the plasma that leaves the body has been measured. It's, uh, and we know it goes to some place that is looking for compression to become acceleration. But Castaneda said the place of power. So chances are the place which is more fractal or rose-like or compression or powerful electrically in the land that he was attached to would be the first place he would go. Often uh, ancestors or relatives that are close feel a piece of that plasma. In Switzerland, there's a hole in the top of the house for grandmother to go out when she dies. I think that only works if the house is made of biologic materials. Like the pyramid has that shaft, you know? It directs the plasma. We know that um, in suicide, for example, like in the movie What Dreams May Come, it's more difficult to follow the plasma because the loss of self-concept means the loss of that identity and that shape of the plasma. The, um, the plasma dissipates. It can. If you take a lot of, if you take good coherence in your life and your plasma is very strong at death, you take more with you. That's what this is about, is about charging the plasma of your aura, that the goal here is a large aura, and that plasma is what you, you squirt into that fractal and create distribution at the moment of death. If we observe the film about when great Tibetan masters die, they shrink gradually and then there are rainbows, and you can see it in the films. And I think the physics is clear that a well-compressed aura add so much fractality to the environment. Uh, we didn't have time for the story, but actually rainbows, uh, the physics of color is that compression that causes waves to be sorted, which is the origin of rainbows, actually. Uh, just very briefly, we're asking, where does the aura go at death? We noticed that when Tibetans die, there are rainbows. They even show up in the film of, uh, who was that one we were watching the other day, Valerie? It's really good. You could see, the, you could see the, the rainbow. It's really very interesting. Anyway, if we look at the physics of color, the, the visible spectrum is 350 to 700 nanometers. The precise wavelengths of the precise primary colors predict an angular measure. So we, we could begin to understand that the photon light travels as a donut, just like you do when you die. <laughs> and uh, photons are like every other wave function. They are always toroids, donuts. And the cone in the eye where you perceive color, the only thing you can use a cone for in physics is to measure the angle, the, ph the phase angle, of the approaching electric field. So the very shape of the place where we perceive color, the cone, proves the fact that color is the phase angle, or tilt, of the photon as a donut. And we realize that the red is the centripetal side of the photon hitting the cone of the eye, and the blue is the centrifugal. And that the precise angular distance between red, green, and blue is a 180 degree tilt of that photon, and the precise linear relationship of the 
tilting photon shows that green is a 90 degree angle, and that makes sense because every living plant spits out green. That's why all chlorophyll is green. And the reason is because the 90 degree angle of the photon donut you call green is square. And that's opposite to conjugate phase, so biology cannot absorb it. It's called negative green in psychotronics. That's why every living plant does not absorb green. That's why you see green. So we see that the primary colors are the simple cube angles, 45, 90, 135. There's only two exceptions. The yellow and blue are the only other angles to create all the primary colors of the tilt of the photon. And those angles are 63 and 117 degrees, which turn out to be precisely the internal face angle of a dodeca. This is 117 degrees, and this is 63 right here. So the reason color happens is because photon donuts adjust their angles to directly face the center of a dodecahedron, which is called phase conjugation. That actually, there's another slide, that, that photons converge in this angle so they conjugate, implode at their core, and that's how they get sorted into color. And you can also prove this because rainbows only happen when the atmosphere is fractal. And I'll show you how we measure fractality in air. So basically, it allows the photons to compress perfectly. And at that plasma center, there they are sorted. Remember the fight in the Irish bar. <laughs> and that sorting process that conjugation allows is the physics of the reason there's color. So it makes sense that if the state value, you see that rainbows in the atmosphere because he's added fractality in the electrical environment. It, he sort of distributed his charge in a fractal. Um, I will say that one of our friends, Michael Rice, holisticarchitecture.com, he has reported been able to, well, I think it was his niece or a family friend died, and he actually went in and found her and brought her back. Um, that a good lucid dreamer, shamanic remote viewing, you can find the plasma. So there is that possibility. A lot of times, like in the movie Highlander, when somebody who has coherence and lucid dreaming in the family, if grandma dies, one of the daughters will feel a great rush. And the plasma of grandma just went into, as in, you know, there can be only one in the Highlander movie. <laughs> and uh, so the plasma is something that does survive death if it's coherent. And that's a big if. And uh, we always tell the story about the, the Hopis were so concerned about the government putting metal sewage pipes on their land on Old Arrivi, the plateau, because the metal sewage pipe fractionate, break up the magnetic lines of their land, and they knew correctly that their ancestors' memory would suffer. Because charge circulation in the fractality of the land magnetics is how you, how actually the ancestors' memory lives in the land and in the bones. Uh, remember that we talked about the dreaming track, the song line before we showed this in the earlier seminars. If you were here for one of the evenings, you saw this already. But just that, a reminder that these white lines, magnetic rivers of conductivity in the land, Braidwood, Canberra, Australia, Rob Gourlay's magnetic mapping, where you find water and mineral, the magnetic rivers in the land turned out to be exactly dreaming track song lines measured of the aboriginals. And you can measure the presence of the underground water under them with phase conscious dielectric. Basically, your plasma goes someplace fractal. <laughs> so we, we told the story of the, the Maori. We think the Ma'ur, the Uru in the term Maori, may mean the same Uru we're about to talk about later today, the history of the Uras race, the Ibi Uru, the Uru, Uru Asela. The ancient dragon culture, um, the Ma'ur, they were told to go to the tip of North New Zealand when they die and project themselves. And you see the magnetic cross points there, and that if you find the fractal plate in the grid, from there you can be distributed. So for example, for both birth and death, our ancestors, the, the uh, Anunnaki, they would go to the place in the land that's fractal. And we use the example for that conversation, just something to think about. In Machu Picchu, there is an altar. And that altar in Machu Picchu, they call it Intiwana's Prism, where the little mountain is fractal to the big mountain behind it. 